this evening. We trust we find ourselves walking in the fear of the Lord. I'd like to uh, start with the song, with the chorus that we sang it there at supper time, but I'd like to uh, start with the chorus, I want more of Jesus. And so uh, I know you all just sat down, but if you want to stand up, we can sing that. And I want to pivot off of that. So, I want more of Jesus, more and more and more. I want more of Jesus than ever had before. More and more of His great love, rich and full and free. I want more of Jesus, so I'll give Him more of me. Thank you, Mr. Seated. I want more of Jesus. So I'll give him more of me. If you really want more of Jesus, that's what you're going to do. Until you don't have any more of you on the throne of your life, you're going to give him all of you. We sing channels only, blessed master. Flowing through us, thou canst use us. And I think of that prism and that white light. And how many times when God tries to flow through us, it gets refracted and messed up because of how much of us is in the way. I wish we were all just channels only for the Blessed Master. The, this evening, the theme for this week, as we uh, heard in the message there Sunday, is to try to... Be that ten times better that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saw in Daniel and his three friends. That divine wisdom coming through those men. Something that you can't make yourself, something that you can't become yourself, you can't mimic yourself. It was divine wisdom. Right. It was something supernatural. It was something that God gives. It's not something that you can conjure up. And tonight I want to talk about What's in the way of becoming like Daniel and his three friends? What's in the way? Why can't we have that? Why don't we see that? And I think I've got right down pretty much to the root of it. So if you'll pay attention tonight and it's really your desire and you really want more of Jesus and you want to give him more of you, say, sit up and pay attention tonight. We're going to be talking right down to the root of this problem. Tonight I want to talk about the subject of idolatry. Idolatry, back in the days of Israel, and back in, you read it in the Old Testament, you'd have people jumping up and down on an altar. Remember when Elijah and the prophets of Baal had a stand down? And they would go out there and publicly pray to this nobody, this God. Oh, Baal, hear us! Didn't do them any good. Yeah, people did it. And they did it for a long time. And I would just imagine that if you, th if you saw me or somebody praying, somebody on the street praying, Oh, Baal, hear us, and jumping up and down and cutting themselves and doing all sorts of things like that, you'd probably be, think it was pretty humorous and you wouldn't be uh, intrigued by it at all. Because we've grown to an understanding where that looks like pure foolishness. It is pure foolish foolishness. But I want to bring your attention to a principle that I found in Ezekiel chapter 14. In verse 1, we'll begin reading. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of, of it all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up idols in his heart and put it the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. 
For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separated himself from me, and set up idols in his heart, and put it the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb, and will cut him off from the midst of my people. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. I want to talk to us today about idols in our heart. Idols in the heart. <coughs> Setting up idols in your heart. It doesn't matter if you go out there and you pray, oh, Baal, hear us, and you're looking at a tree stump. That doesn't matter. The problem with those people when they did that is that they had idols in their heart. And at that time, it wasn't so foolish to have one to go pray to it. And so they did it. And a lot of times people will do that in different ways today. And they'll show it on the outside too. But the problem was that their heart had idols. They had idols in their heart. And it manifested itself in different ways. And these men in the house of Israel, they come and they sit and be, the elders come unto Jeremiah or to Ezekiel here. And they say, they're coming to the prophet. And God says, these men have idols in their heart. Did Ezekiel see that? Were they praying to idols? They were coming to the prophet. <clears throat> Made me think of when uh, God was looking for a man to be king over Israel. Israel decides they want to have a king over them instead of the judges that God had set up. So God's looking for a man in Israel. And he's looking through all these people, all these men, all these young men, middle-aged men, Passing him by. And he finally finds a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the father of Saul. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the any of the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. That's God's evaluation of Saul at this time in his life. God looks at this man. God doesn't look on the outward appearance. Remember, he looks on the heart. This is what he was looking for. He was looking for idols in the heart of any young man. He wanted him to be king. He wanted him to be captain over his inheritance, over Israel. And so he's looking to find a man whose heart condition is such that there's no idols in his heart to where he worships God only. And he has a proper evaluation of himself. So God says there wasn't a goodlier person than he. And then it says from his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. So he was a, he was a, a fit figure, but I guarantee you when God handpicked this man, it was because of a heart condition and he had a good appearance. And then we uh, go down. It tells a little bit about this man and the, and the story of the lost donkeys. And then he comes to Samuel. And they went up into the city. And when they came into the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. And the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the land of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cries come unto me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. And Saul drew near to Samuel to the gate, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul, and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today. And tomorrow I will let thee go, and tell thee all that is in thine heart. And then he goes on down, a couple verses later, he tells him, is not uh, the next verse and on whom is all the desire of Israel is it not on thee and on thy father's house and Saul answers and says am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family the least of the families of the tribes of Benjamin wherefore then speakest thou so to me you see the heart condition that that Saul has at this time and you see what God God is very pleased with this young man and in Samuel takes Saul, his servant, uh, Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden. Sam, uh, Saul is getting set up for great victory. God's looking for a king. God's looking for a captain over his inheritance. He finds the man with the right heart condition and he's got the prophet here to anoint him. And he says, And the cook took up the shoulder that was upon it and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Behold that which is left. Set it before thee and eat, for unto this time hath it been kept for thee since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And then, uh, then a couple verses later, Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, is, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? God had looked through the nation of Israel and no doubt found the most perfect candidate for this, for this position, and it was Saul. God's blessing was upon that man. God was going to make him great. God was going to make him 
ten times better. God was going to flow through Saul to be captain over his inheritance. Saul had the right heart condition. Saul's perspective of himself was in the right place. But for some reason, within a few years, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Something's happened. God took this man who had his heart condition in the right place and began to make him great. Began to give him a position. Give him power. Give him prestige. Give him honor. He was trying to make him. He was trying to use this human vessel and flow through him. And when he got to being lifted up, some shift happened. And Saul decided to view himself a little bit different. What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast, not thou, wast thou not made head of the tribes of Israel? That's why he was made head of the tribes of Israel. God needed a man that he could flow through. He didn't need a man that he could start to make great and use for him, and all of a sudden, this happens. That wasn't what God wanted. Let me tell you, if God's ever going to use you for anything, don't let it go to your head. Amen. That'll stand in the way. If that had happened to Daniel, you wouldn't hear about Daniel the beloved, Daniel the greatly beloved of God, Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You wouldn't hear about all that. He wouldn't have become ten times better. The Spirit of God couldn't have flown through him and given him such great wisdom and understanding because it just, bang, gone to his head. It's one thing to be little in your own sight when you're... Not much. A lot of people can't even achieve that. But if God ever began to use you in this way, look what Saul, the prestige and the power. What a position. So what if God did ever decide to use you? Could he depend on you for more than a year or two? God sees those seeds in people. How many people did he pass over because he knew they couldn't handle it? He was afraid that would happen. When thou wast little in thine own sight. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalekites. God had work for you to do. He wasn't just coming to butter you up and make you look good and make you feel good. He had work for you to do. This wasn't going to be easy. He had a job for you to do. He had a big job for you to do. It might get you some glory. It might not get you some glory. But he needed a man that he was able to work through to be a channel of his divine wisdom, his power, his blessing to his inheritance. He didn't need a big head. And so he chooses Saul, who at the time that he chose him, was little in his own sight. He was set up for it, but he was still had choices. And this is just one of the areas, this is one of the situations that can happen where you can keep God from being able to make you into something. The Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalekites and fight against them till they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? I love it when you read God's perspective of a situation. I, <clears throat> I wonder what it would be like if we got God's perspective of all the situations that everybody's got their little excuses for why they did what they did. If God came in and gave his verdict of what exactly happened there and told you your intents and your motives and everything behind it. It might sound like this, fly upon the spoil. And it's evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Your self-evaluation of yourself means nothing if God doesn't agree. It means absolutely nothing. It's only self-deception. And have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, king of the Am Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, listen, Passing the blame means absolutely nothing if God doesn't agree with your verdict. It means absolutely nothing. Took of the spoil sheep and oxen and went on. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Saul was... Uh, had an idol in his heart. 
Saul had set up an idol in his heart. He was little in his own sight when he got chosen. God began to use him and make him great. And an idol got set up in his heart. And it was his image. It was his self. And began to worship that idol. It says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. That was the very next verse. Oh, Saul wasn't worshiping idols. He wasn't saying, oh, Baal, hear us. He wasn't doing that. But he just got rejected by God because he had an idol in his heart called stubbornness, idolatry. Well, that's not as bad as Baal. Well, he got rejected by God because of it. And the Spirit of God departed from Saul. And an evil spirit troubled him. No, he wasn't on his knees to a rock or a post. He had stubbornness in his heart and he got rejected by God because of it. Because God saw that he'd been dethroned and there was an idol in his heart. And God couldn't use him anymore. That's the spiritual reality. That's the God that we're expecting to gain heaven from. That's the God that needs to say, well done, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I don't care if you show up and say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils. We did many, many, many wonderful works. We're great. We did lots of good things. I took out the trash. I obeyed. I've done all the commandments. It doesn't matter if you go up and you say all that stuff. If he says, depart from me. He wasn't convinced. The only thing I'm here for us tonight is to help you understand the terms of reconciliation with God so that God is convinced about your performance and your heart condition. I'm hitting it right at the root, right in the heart is where I want to hit it. I'm not worried. If, I, if we can get it fixed in the heart, it'll fix on. Jesus said, make first clean the inside that the outside may be clean also. If we can get it fixed in the heart, the outside will be clean also. If the outside's not clean, it's because it's dirty on the inside. But just because the outside's all garnished and looks clean doesn't mean it's clean on the inside. I want each of us to take a little walk down to the throne room in our lives. Take a little walk down there to our throne room. Who sits on that throne? Who sits on that throne in your throne room? In your life? Walk down there. Think about your decisions. Think about your life. Think about who and what dictates what. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Stubbornness is as idolatry. God said stubbornness is as idolatry. When God sees stubbornness, he sees you sitting on that chair and he wants to do something with you and he sees stubbornness and you're sitting on that chair. You're in charge of your life. It's idolatry. It's stubbornness. And you'll get judged just like the man who said, oh, Baal, hear us, to a stump or whatever he wanted to pray to because it was that stubbornness. It was stubbornness that made him do that. Remember, God needs to be convinced of your performance. I don't need to be convinced. Mommy doesn't need to be convinced. Daddy doesn't need to be convinced. They should all be convinced if God's convinced. But that's not just because you convinced us. You can dupe me. Guaranteed. I can't see what's in your heart like God can see what's in your heart. There's things that we can kind of see at times, but I guarantee you, we haven't been told to beware of sheep and wolves' clothing. So when we see wolves' clothing, we can kind of go, you know, the attitudes of a wolf and those types of things. We can go, that's, that's a wolf there. But there are such things as wolves in sheep's clothing where they look an awful lot like a sheep. And it's not proper for me necessarily to make a judgment on that person's heart. But that doesn't matter. What I'm telling you is God knows the heart. And just because I think you're on your way to heaven and I think you're a Christian, there's been people that I've called brothers. There's been people that I thought were right with God. They're going to turn around. Next thing you know, you find out there was an idol on that heart. Right. It's not about me being right or you being right or winning an argument or anything. It's all about 
you understanding the proper terms of reconciliation. I'm here to beseech you in Christ's stead to be reconciled to God. And if I don't give you the right terms of reconciliation, the proper expectations of what God's going to demand, I'm misleading. So I'm trying from the scripture to give us a proper understanding of what God's going to expect when you enter into the throne room and you have your, all your suitcase of deeds and whatever, attitudes and everything, and you're judged thereby. I want you to be very ready for that day. Who sits on the throne room? Who sits on the throne of your life? Well, <clears throat> God, of course. Really? I want that to be the case, and I'm not here to make accusation. I'm here to give warning and to give terms of reconciliation whereby we can gauge ourselves against this. There's no sense sticking your head in the sand and pretending. There's no sense doing that. When it's, depart from me. Lord, Lord, we did this, so depart from me. Depart. It's over. I don't want you to be in that position. Is it the fear of man? You know, ultimately, you sit on the throne of your life and you control it or you let God control it. But there's a lot of ways where things can become your idol, individual things. And the fear of man seems to have been something here along with his ego that stumbled Saul. Wanting to please man. It could be your image. Your image. I'm not willing to be humbled. I'm not willing to look bad. I'm not willing to stand up for Jesus, even if it makes me look dumb. I know it won't be popular. I'm not willing to do it. So I'm going to maintain my image and shut my mouth. Is it your comfort? I'm not going to be... A, I'm not going to be inconvenienced that much. My comfort's too important to me. Oh, guys, I don't expect anybody to be admitting this. But think about it down deep in your heart and your soul. Think about it like this. Is it my, is it my money? Is it my money? Do you worship your money? No, I don't worship my money. Well, that would look really foolish to worship your money. You know, get down and pray to your dollar bill. Get down and tell your dollar bill, dollar bill, I trust you. Pull me out of a pinch. I trust you to save me. Oh, dollar, I trust you to bring me happiness. I think you're the one that has it. So I'm going to choose you when it's time to choose you over what I know is right. I'm going to choose you over honesty every once in a while, Dollar, because I know that happiness comes from you, Dollar. No, I wouldn't pray like that. But do you do that? Come on. Would you trade... Would you trade a preference of God, what he would prefer you do when it comes to your money, when it comes to how you make your money, when it comes to how you spend your money? Would you trade God's preferences for an extra dollar? Would you trade God's preference for what he would have you to do for an extra comfort? Would you trade... God's preferences for what he would have you to do in your life to maintain your image. Would you trade God's preferences for what he would have you do in your life because of the fear of man, wanting to please man, not to want to make somebody upset? What about your toys? Would you trade God's preferences in your life of what he would have you do with your resources, with your things. What kind of pleasures he would want you to have, your entertainment from at any level. Would you trade one of God's preferences for what he would have you do with this moment, this time, for toys? What about if it's a man, a young man? Would you trade God's preferences for what he would have you do with your life? How he would have you conduct your life for a young man? 
Or would you do it for a young lady? These are things that God looks at in our life and says, you've set up an idol in your life. I can't get through to you because every time you think about listening to me, you think about how much it's going to cost you in your pocketbook. You're praying to your dollar bill. You've got an idol in your heart. Every time I try to get you to do something right, you've got this catch in your life. It's the fear of man. You don't know what it's going to make you look like with your friends. Every time I try to instruct you, every time I try to get this area of your life fixed, I can't help you because it's that young man over there or that young woman over there. And you're afraid about what it's going to make you look like. You've got an idol set up in your heart. And those things are deceitful because you can have a lot of other things right, but God's trying to bring you up and perfect you. God wants to make a Daniel out of you. He wants to make you, he wants to let his divine nature flow through you, but he can't because every time he tries to get you to do something, you've got this catch, you've got this idol in your heart. It's your way. I'm going to do it my way. God says, what if I want to change your way? I got a new way. This is, I got, this is the way I do things. Your desires, your friend. Every time I try to fix that person's problem, every time I preach, every time I have an authority talk to them, every time I have a preacher say the right things to them, every time I'm trying to get through to that person's life because I love them and I want to save them, there's a friend comes to their mind. They can't stand facing their friend with getting this fixed. That friend is an idol in that person's life. And God says it keeps me from being able to sit on the throne in that person's life. I can't take the throne because there's a friend on there. Get the friend off that throne. Come on. Get money off the mind. If you know what God would have you to do, he should have your pocketbook. He should have your, your image should be all about serving God. Your friends should be godly friends. You should be bringing them to Christ. God needs to be on the throne of your life or there's idols in the heart and he says he's going to set his face against that man. I don't think we can deny the reality of the truth of this fact. But no, you wouldn't sit over there and pray to your friend, friend, depending on you, I trust you, I know that you have the best interest for me in mind, I'm willing to trade everything in the world for you, I'm even willing to dethrone God for you, friend, I'm not going to risk anything for your relationship, friend, because you have my best interest, all happiness comes from you, friend. Yeah, you're not going to sit over there and do that. You don't have to do that. God said there's an idol in your heart. That would be being a little bit too honest with yourself. The devil wants it to be more inconspicuous than that. He doesn't want you to recognize it as an idol. Right. I'm trying to help us recognize these things the way God recognizes them. You don't have to worship to a stone to be called an idolater. God said stubbornness. Stubbornness is idolatry. Rebellion as witchcraft, but stubbornness is that idolatry. I guarantee you, every time he sees himself get bumped away, nope, nope, God, you're not, nope, not telling me what to do, nope, not fixing it, there's a friend there. My way, my desires, I don't like that, it's not tasteful. Nope, that's going to cost me too much money. Nope, well, you know that's not honest, you know that isn't right. Nope, I, I'm going to make this buck and I'll fix it with you later. God, gotcha. baloney. There's an idol in that heart. And you could go on and on and on. And you know where it would tick with you. You know which one would hit you or which one would hit me. I would know for me. And as I think of Daniel, who became ten times better, who's the example in this scenario, did he have the fear of man? That didn't rule his life. No, he was out in the, in the king of Babylon's palace. He, nope, he was going to eat pole. He was going to have pulse to eat. Not the king's meat. Daniel had God on the throne of his life. And even though he was in a foreign country, in all, uh, all kinds of problems, the world was crashing down around him. Yet, with God on the throne, he didn't want to offend God on the throne. He would risk his life and eat pulse over the king's meat, even if it killed him. He didn't want to give God any trace of jealousy or feeling that God wasn't there. I guarantee you, that stemmed from a deep, Conviction about his relationship with God and not wanting to offend God in any way. He didn't want to die any more than any of you want to die. He wanted friends just bad as any of you want friends. He wanted money just bad as any of you want money. It got all taken away from him. Now he's a slave. You think his image mattered to him? 
Did he have to give that one up too? Guaranteed he wasn't ever walking around trying to have a certain cool image. It was all about making sure God, risking his life, when he lost everything, he wasn't in a pity party puddle. That would have been another idol. It was still, I didn't want to offend God. No wonder he was greatly beloved. Do you think it was all about Daniel's comfort? If he wasn't comfortable, he wasn't going to be spiritual? No, guarantee you, it wasn't about his comfort. He was willing to die. He was willing to lose everything. I'm sure life was not comfortable. The king wasn't there to make these slaves comfortable. And yet, in the midst of all that, he wasn't going to offend God. I don't think it was Daniel's money either. If it had been Daniel's money, he wouldn't have had this. He didn't have no money. He didn't have anything. He was a slave. He didn't have any toys. He didn't have any hope of getting married and having a future. He was a slave. If that would have been stumbling him and crashed him, he can't be spiritual without that, he'd have been a goner. You think it was about being my way? No, he didn't get to do anything his way. The only thing that he got to do his way is when it came to, I'm not dethroning God, I'm not going to offend God, and it's God's way, and I'll die by it. But he didn't get to do anything his way. His desires? No, who, who would, no, if he was run by his desires, I guarantee you he wouldn't have been willing to eat pulse over the meat. And it wasn't his friends. He had three good friends. And they all encouraged each other in a good way. Friends can be powerful, good influences too. But him and his three friends, and his three friends particularly in one instance, were going to the fiery furnace together. Yeah, they had this figured out too. This is the recipe. You don't give God any reason to be jealous over the throne room of your life. Or he's going to call it, you have an idol in your heart. He, you can never become what Daniel became. You can never have the divine influence flowing through you that people can recognize in the world and go, the wisdom that's coming there is ten times better than the wisdom that's coming from the astrologers that we have. In Colossians 3 it says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. It's idolatry and covetousness, all those things. And covetousness is idolatry. Think of it. If you had never heard the truth of this topic, which you probably understand, already understood some of the truth, maybe some of you hadn't thought of it this far, and you showed up in God's courtroom and he said, you're an idolater. You're like, what in the world? And he began to explain to you what I'm explaining to you today. It would be too late then. It's not too late right now. We can fix this. I want you to stay down there by your throne room and I want you to think about it. I want you to think about your decisions of your life and what you've done. What makes you angry? What makes you happy? Is it the same things that makes God angry and makes God happy? Good. What makes you go and what makes you stop? Is it the same thing that may make God go and make God stop? Think about it. Who's on the throne room? Well, there's a lot of good things that I do that that are good. Yeah, but God's trying to make something out of you. Saul did a lot of good things too that were good, but God sent him on a mission and wanted him to do something, and when he didn't do it, it was stubbornness. He said, I can't take you any further. You're stubborn. It won't do you any good to focus on the Lord. Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils. We did many wonderful works and neglect to focus on the part that God's trying to work on right now. I want to encourage us to focus on that part of our life right now. Don't sit there and dull yourself to sleep because of something good that you did. If there's something that needs worked on, let's work on it. Covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. 
But now also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing ye have put off the old man with his deeds, then have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Samuel tells Saul, But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Oh, but Saul had done this right, and done that right, and done this right. That was wonderful. That's what he was supposed to do. Why did he stop? Yeah, he was little in his own sight, and he, God chose him, and God said he was the best, and God said, yeah, he... Saul would have had a whole list of things that he could have said that was God's endorsement. Samuel spoke in all kinds of nice things about him. But it doesn't matter. He just got rejected, guys. He just got rejected. All that's true. All that's true. He just got rejected. <clears throat> so God rejects Saul. Then Samuel calls Jesse and his sons to anoint a king. And it came to pass when they were come, they looked on Leliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. The Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. <coughs> the Lord looketh on the heart and the outward appearance. But God sees right through to the heart. Why does God look on the heart? That's where the root is. That's the root of why you do what you do. He's looking down there at your throne room. He's seeing who's sitting on that throne room. He's seeing whenever I say go, do they go? Are they jealous to keep me in that position? Have my preferences... Do they have unrivaled priority and authority in your life? Unrivaled doesn't mean there was, there's nothing else out there in the world. Unrivaled means it's not even close. That's what it means. It means I don't give them a, I don't give them a chance. God knows I'm very jealous to have his relationship I know that joy and happiness and goodness come from God. And I'm not going to risk trading that for a few dollars, for a little bit of fun, kick God off for a little bit. I think this is going to pay better. And you're constantly making this decision, do what's right, be honest. or What a slap in the face to God. Am I going to let the dollar bill have the throne this time or am I going to let God have the throne? I think this time I'm going to be happier in the long run to go ahead and let... I'm going to worship the dollar this time. Oh, I wouldn't say it like that. <clears throat> you might do it like that. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart because God sees all this transaction that goes on in the heart. God sees all this decision-making that goes on in the heart. He watches the person who's jealous to have a relationship with God. And if he knows to do good, he's going to do it. If he knows it's going to make God happy, he's going to do it. He knows that having God smile on his life is better than having the friends smile on his life. And he's not going to trade. It's not even close. It's unrivaled. And God watches that. And there may be imperfections in that person's life on the outside, but he watches that throne room. He says, I can take that person out of darkness and I can bring them into marvelous light. I can shine my light on their path and they're going to follow it because they're jealous from my relationship. All I have to do is show them more and they're going to do more. That's why he watches the heart. He also watches the person who's trying to have a little bit of both worlds and trying to decide, is it going to be worth it this time? Should I make my friends happy this time or should I make God happy this time? If I make my friends happy tonight, we're, everything's going to be peaceful. If I stand up for God right now, it could be a challenge. Am I willing to offend God? Am I willing to laugh at that? Am I willing to go along with that? Is it gonna, could it offend God? You wouldn't eat pulse in the king's palace at the risk of your life. You wouldn't do it if you're dealing with that. And you'll never become, you'll never become a channel only for the blessed master. 
You'll never have that divine wisdom, that divine influence flowing through you and become the ten times better until God sees this trend in your life long enough where He can entrust you to where as soon as He starts putting it flowing through you, all of a sudden you don't go bonkers like Saul did. In Proverbs 23, 6, it says, eat, not thou, eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he, but his heart is not with thee. You can't see all of that, but God can see all of that. God can see, but his heart is not with thee. You can't necessarily see all that. It's a deceitful person. But as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Whatever dictates the decisions in his heart, the way he thinks, his thought processes, that's the one he worships. And if God sees you, yeah, I'll do this because I think that I keep my image positionally, that would be probably a good thing to do and it ain't going to cost me too much if I do it this way. And he sees all your maneuverings before you make your decisions and all this selfishness involved. He doesn't feel like he's an unrivaled, uh, you're, he has unrivaled preference, authority in your life. He calls it idolatry. Continue down in 1 Samuel 16, 8. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Wonder what God saw. Wonder what God saw in Abinadab. He looked at the throne room in his life. If he would have been a perfect candidate, why not choose this? I says, No. So Eliab shows up, looks like to Samuel, looks like the perfect candidate for what we're looking for. God says, no. There's an idol in that heart. What if somebody tried to tell Eliab that he had an idol in his heart? That he was an idol worshiper. Or that he was being judged by God like that. Probably wouldn't have listened. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. He said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. What was it in Shammah? Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. This was a family of a noble father, and there's a whole group of boys here, eight sons. Reject, 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 reject. Because man seeth, God seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. If man had showed up and went to choose from one of his sons, it would have been Eliab. Right. Let me tell you, man doesn't choose who goes to heaven either. Right. Man doesn't choose who gets God's approval either. And man, God looks on the heart. <clears throat> He's making these decisions. So if the Lord had, what if this was Judgment Day? What if this is a picture of Judgment Day? What if we find out that this really did play out this way in Judgment Day? If these young men didn't get the idols off of their heart? Eight brothers. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. If it had been up to those other boys to have a king in Israel after God's own heart, it wouldn't have happened. God looked through all the kingdom of Israel. And he finds David. Thanks, Eliab. Good thing David was there. Thanks, Shama. Good thing David was there. You had never heard anything good. You didn't know how to be good. You grew up in the same family. Good thing David was there. What about you? What about us? God has work he wants to do. There's a work that needs to be done. He doesn't have too many laborers in his harvest, in his vineyard. But he has to have 
the throne of your life. He has to have the throne of your heart in order to use you. Amen. Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Well, I, don't, I can't see what's wrong with this person, but the Lord didn't choose him. Oh, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. No, neither hath the Lord chosen this. I don't know why, but the Lord didn't choose him. Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Seven sons. These were the best. He thought this was definitely the ones he'd be picking from. It's got to be one of these. Surely the Lord's anointed. This one looks, this is perfect. You've got such a nice family. Samuel the prophet. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Walk on. Something was wrong. And God specifically says, because I don't look at the outward appearance, I'm looking at their hearts right now. Don't be confused. What if God showed up and began to give verdicts and to give judgment and to be give correction? We'd be like, what? And be like, I don't, I'm not looking at what you're looking at. I'm looking at the heart. And there's a heart problem. There's a heart problem. I'm not on the throne of that person's life. I've been working with that person for the last few years. I've, been, I've had this message preached. I had this message preached. I had this person talk to him. I had this message preached and this message preached. And every single time it comes down to what that friend's going to say. Comes down to how much it's going to cost him. Comes down to how much comfort it's going to cost him. Comes down to their image every single time. Oh, they got dressed up nice because it helps their image in this situation. Oh, they know how to talk, right, because it helps their image. Oh, and it would make them look bad in their friends if they said the wrong thing. No, they're not going to get down and worship Baal. That'd make them look stupid. But that's the only reason they won't do it. Because in their heart, I've been working with them. And every time I go to work with them, they dethrone me and choose their friend. They dethrone me and choose their dollar. Come on. No, I don't see his man seed. I know you're surprised. You guys didn't know all this about this person. But there's something down deep in that heart I can't get through. I can't change that person's life. There's an idol down there. Is God having to compete in your life? He will only have so much patience for it. Oh, these boys didn't know that God was looking for a king. They might have tried to fix it up real quick. No, you don't know what God has in mind either. You don't know when that trumpet's going to sound and you start, you're going to be passing before the judge. Neither that the Lord chosen this. I don't see as man seeth. Lord, do you send them to hell? Yep, I don't see as man seeth. I fought with them for three years. I preached, I sent prophets. I warned, I warned, I warned. I fought with them for about three years. It's reality. God's the one who rejected these people based on a heart condition when they looked perfect. God's the one who did that. You do know that God is looking for precious fruit of the earth. You do know what God is working on here. That's why we continually bring it to mind. That's why we're talking about it. We don't want you to be surprised or ignorant of what's going to happen. We want you to be well aware so that we have an opportunity. So then they go and they get David. <clears throat> the Lord says, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Wow. Wow. Wow, God who looks at the heart, looks at the root of all the thoughts, the motives, the intentions, who's on the throne of that life, and he says, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. What an honor. Yes, amen. What an honor. Amen. Wow. Who or what do we really worship? What makes us do what we do? Is there an area where God is trying to correct something in our life and we're continually resisting? I'm not talking about an occasional stumble, get back up, fix it, and move on. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about God is trying to steer your life. There's a problem. There's an idol. There's an image. I'm not willing to give my image. I'm not willing to give up a friend. I'm not willing to do what Daniel did to be what Daniel was, but I'd just like to somehow... Be it. I'd like to be just that smart. Not going to get there that way. What do you really worship? I hope you've been down there thinking about your throne room, your heart condition, and that you can begin to answer this question. Is there something that's competing with God or does God's preferences 
really have unrivaled priority? Does God feel like his preferences really have unrivaled priority in your life? Or is he offended time and time again by the competition? Are there idols in the heart? Is there stubbornness in the heart? Is that what we're struggling with? Would God pass over you? Walk on. What would he say? Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Let me just say, comforting yourself before it's time to be comforted is a sure way to deceive your heart. Telling yourself it's okay before God thinks it's okay is a sure way to deceive your heart. I want it to be okay for you. I want it to be okay for me. But there's nothing valuable in sticking head in the sand and comforting yourself that everything's okay if it's not okay. Allow God's Spirit to work. Allow Him to speak. Allow Him to reveal to you there's an area here that I'm weary of the competition. I will only take resistance so much longer. And then I will set my face against that man because there's an idol in their heart. In Isaiah 1, 1, it says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? We need to ask ourselves, to what purpose? Yeah. That's a good question. To what purpose am I doing what I'm doing for the Lord? Well, it's for the Lord, of course. Are you sure? To what purpose? There's a lot of ulterior motives to do decent things. These people, God says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord. He didn't say to what purpose are you being naughty for. We all know that. But there was a problem here. And thus saith the Lord said, to what purpose? I'm full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, they came to appear before him. Who hath required this of your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. I thought it was supposed to be sweet incense. Well, it would be. Except when God looked at that heart, and he saw the idolatry in that heart, and he saw his people coming over to him, and worshiping him, and bringing the sacrifices, and burning the incense, and doing everything just right for some ulterior motive. To what purpose are you doing that? I'm not happy. I'm sick of it. Right. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. You guys are playing church. You got it all figured out. You're going through all the motions and you're having your solemn assemblies and these prayer meetings. I know of groups that are licentious, not serving the Lord according to his terms, and boy, they can get together and have a prayer meeting. And they have prayer meetings two times a week. And they can pray and pray and pray and say it all just as angelic as you can imagine. And I've heard some of them go for it. And I want to say, to what purpose? Look at the way your life is. Look at your decisions in your life. Look at the God sitting in the parking lot that you worship. Look at the God of your image that you're walking. To what purpose? God is not the master of your life. God's preferences don't have unrivaled priority. But that doesn't keep them from saying all the right things. It doesn't keep them from having a solemn assembly. God says, I cannot away with. Bring no more vain oblations. Give it up. It's a show. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. Whoa. Hey guys, this is the good that they're doing. Let's think. They need to fix their heart. God hates what's going on right now. God commanded all of these ceremonies and these meetings. God commanded all this. These could be good, holy, proper things if the heart was right. If God was on the throne in their heart, 
This would be sweet incense. This would be good fellowship. This would be for the productive building up of the church, for the edifying of the body of Christ. This would be exactly where God would meet when two or three are gathered together. This would be wonderful. But if he doesn't have priority in their life, if he's not on the throne in their life, then it becomes an abomination. He says, my soul hateth. Your appointed feasts. Who appointed those feasts? Yeah, yeah his soul hated them. This is what God said. <coughs> he says, saith the Lord. And when you spread forth your hands and pray, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. And he says, wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. He starts listing all the things where he's been dealing with them. What would that list be in your life? You don't, want your, you don't want God to feel this way about your solemn meeting, your prayers. When you spread forth your hands, you want God to hear. You want God to answer. What is it? What would it be that would need cleaned up? I hope that God is giving you a list. I hope that you're paying attention. I hope you're staying in that room for a while, listening. And I hope that God is working with His Spirit and you're making a list of the things that need to be cleaned up so that your worship is pure. I hope that when God sees you walk into church, He's not disgusted because of the pollution that just walked into something holy. I have all these people gathering in and I have the, I have the reins on all these people. I'm the unrivaled priority in their life and I got pollution walking in and they're going to spread their attitude. They're going to spread their appetite. They're going to spread their desires. Well, but they're praying with everybody else. God looks down, and he may not see a beautiful picture. You know, I think of it when we looked. You have a, a group of young people all up singing. Oh, what a beautiful picture. A lot of people love to see that and to listen to it. I think of what God sees when he looks down. The only way that picture is going to be beautiful in God's eyes is if he is on the throne room, on the throne in every one of those people's hearts. If he looks down and he's like, idol worshiper, idol worshiper, idol worshiper, there's a true worshiper, there's a true worshiper, idol worshiper, idol worshiper. Seven of his sons passed, reject, 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 reject. There's one. That's not a beautiful picture. God sees his jewel in a very vulnerable spot. Quit singing praises to me. Quit talking about me. Quit praying to me. Go get me on the throne. Fix the problems. He gives you a list. He gave them a list of the things they needed to do. Relieve the oppressed. Hey, you want to be spiritual? Go relieve the oppressed, you. You want to be spiritual? Go fix your attitude with so-and-so. Go fix that relationship. You want to be spiritual? When those things are fixed and I'm on the throne of your life again, then you're done having God competing for that throne. Then your prayer comes up as sweet incense. God wants to have that relationship. But God doesn't see as man sees. So we see a beautiful picture. And God looks on the heart and he sees one out of eight. We see a nice family, a bunch of fine young men there. All of Jesse's sons. And God sees one out of eight. <clears throat> Samuel didn't know. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. That's why I'm saying don't compare yourselves among yourselves. It's not wise, the Bible says. It's not wise. You let God do the work in your heart. Don't say it's okay because I got mommy to say it's okay and she thinks I'm a good boy. Or I got daddy to say it's okay and he thinks I'm a good boy. And I'm doing it, I'm doing it good. Where all my, my, my good friends, they think it's okay. Look, I don't care if I think it's okay. If you and your heart don't feel like God thinks it's okay, it's not okay. You got Samuel who thinks it's okay? Neither hath the Lord chosen this. If God doesn't think it's okay, if God's working in your heart, and he doesn't think it's okay, and he's got things that need fixed, it's not okay until those things are fixed. God sees this 
Worship. This show of worship when he knows he's not on the throne and you're acting like it. He sees it as mutiny. He sees it as deception. He sees you as a wolf among the sheep. And it's not pretty. He's not happy that you just showed up for church if you're living in rebellion to him and you're not going to listen to him. He's not happy about that. We might be happy that this person just showed up for church because we didn't know he is full-blown rebellion against God. If you're not going to let God do his work in your life, you look like a wolf that just walked into a pure setting. Matthew 15, 7, it says, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. <coughs> They draw a nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. They looked good, had it together, but their heart was far from him. While they were drawing nigh, saying all the right things, honoring him with their lips, being an influence on other people of how to draw nigh and honor God with your lips and yet live this way. And their heart was far from him. For the word of God in Hebrews 12, 4.12. 4, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not made manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He's the one with him whom we have to do. I'm not the one with whom you have to do. Daddy's not the one with whom you have to do. God is the one with whom you have to do. I just want, when you stand before God, I want God to say, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. <clears throat> the word of God is a discerner. You know how that happens? When the word of God is spoken to you, when the word of God, when you read the word of God, God is watching and he sees when God speaks through his word, he's watching the thoughts and intentions of your heart that are happening at this moment. He's watching either resistance or repentance. He's watching pride or humility. And as the Spirit of God and the Word of God speaks and is presented, it's discerning, it's showing the thoughts and intentions of your heart. And all things are open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God knows who you worship on the inside. Because as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You are exactly that. <clears throat> the judgment that you get on judgment day will be based on your thoughts and intents of your heart. What you did with what you knew. <clears throat> In James 1.26, it says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Those are things that we watch for. Those are things that we can watch for in ourselves first. If I seem to be religious and I think I have it all together, next thing you know, it's like, I've got this besetting problem. He bridleth not his tongue. But I think I'm okay because I, I do go to church and I do this and I do good and I listen to the pastor and I love church. And I love God, but I can't bridle my tongue. You've deceived your own heart and your religion is vain. I didn't make that one up. You can find it in James. If any man among you seem to be religious... He didn't say just to the people who don't have any discernment at all. No, this is James here. He's a bishop. If any man among you seem to be religious, but he doesn't know how to bridle his tongue, then God is not on the throne of his life because I'm sure that the Lord has convicted him about his tongue and he still ain't bridling it. He's still running it. Still not bridled. It says his religion is vain. 
That kind doesn't get you in. That kind, neither hath the Lord chosen this. <coughs> Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widow in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. <coughs> we talked about here in Revelation 2, I had it in my notes, about Ephesus. Has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. It was just a little thing, wasn't it? They had borne, had patience, the nine, my name's sake had labored and had not fainted. They had tried them, they said they're apostles, and found them liars. They couldn't bear them which were evil. It didn't matter. They were going to get spewed out. Their candlestick was going to get removed. And will remove thy candlestick out of its place. That's all I need to hear to get me perked up. Amen. I don't need to be comparing myself among ourselves tonight. This is God here talking again. I will come unto thee quickly. I've showed you the problem. God has different ways of showing you the problem. But God says, I have showed you the problem. There's an idol in your heart. There's been a shift in your love, in your affection. And it hasn't showed on the outside. Eliab's standing there and Samuel thinks the Lord, surely the Lord's anointing is before him. God says, nope, I saw something in his heart. Pass him on. Okay? This church there in Revelation, what a biblical church. That'd be an amazing church. There is nothing visible talked about in that church there was a problem with anything visible it looked perfect God saw a root something in the heart something in the affection and he wasn't going to compete he said I will come and I will remove your candlestick out of its place unless you repent God is no respecter of persons You might have felt like you got away with stuff growing up by your authorities because you were cute or handsome. Don't let that throw you into hell. God is no respecter of persons. Eliab sounds like he was a pretty handsome fella. Probably looked like he had really good character. There was a problem. And all I need to know about that whole story is that God rejected him. That's all I need to know. All I need to know right here is that their candlestick was going to get removed unless they repented. Right. All the fluff and the pretty. That all needed to be there. That's great. But God wasn't going to compete in the throne of your life. In Romans 2.11 it says, For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. <clears throat> Skip down to 2.16. There's a parenthesis in there. But it goes on the same thought here. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. You know there was a day when I read these warnings. I read these things, and it would put fear in my heart. I would read these things about proclaiming on the housetops, and it would put fear in my heart, put a little bit of dread in my heart. And as I began to submit my life to Christ, to give God unrivaled place in my heart, as I began to work on His projects instead of working on my projects, I can honestly say that when I read those things, there's more joy than dread. Amen. 
When you're doing God's work, you might be misunderstood. People aren't going to know. They're going to misjudge you. Oh, you're just screaming over the pulpit. You just got this. You got this. Or you got this problem. Or because you're standing up for God. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men. In the day when God brings things open in the light on the housetops, He will reveal all the true thoughts and intentions of the heart. And as you submit your life to Christ, as you give Him the throne of your life, and you're misunderstood, but it was for God. You lose a friend and you get accused of stuff, but it was for God. The more damage, the more, the more times you struggle, but it was for God. The more you're going to start reading those verses, and it's going to bring joy in your heart. Someday you're going to be vindicated. Someday the truth will be known. When you know that the truth is going to reveal that you stood with God, that God had the unrivaled priority in your life, you sought out His preferences and you never made Him feel jealous for that spot. You never made Him feel like somebody else was about to grab it. It's okay if I'm misunderstood. It's okay if I'm rejected. It's okay if I'm not comfortable. It's okay if it costs me. When you become like that, and that becomes the new course of your life, that you've put on the new man. The old man is gone. There'll be more joy than dread. You look forward to it. Get to the point where you can't wait. <clears throat> There's no respect of persons with God. Ephesians 6, 6, not with eye service as men pleasers. It's an idol. But as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God, worshiping God from the heart. Doing the will of God from the heart. That's a powerful statement. Not just all your new moons, your feasts, your spreading of your hands, your making many prayers, your oblations, your all this stuff. They weren't doing the will of God from the heart. They were doing the will of God with an ulterior motive. Doing the will of God from the heart is a clarifier in there that hits the root. Obviously, you're not doing the will of God at all if you're not doing it from the heart. But to say the extra pins it down so that you're not being deceived. Your heart isn't deceiving you. In 1 Chronicles 28, 9, it says, And thou, Solomon, my son... Know thou that the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. The Lord searches all hearts and he understands. Oh, God will understand why I didn't listen to him. No, that's not what he's going to understand. He understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. All the planning, all the scheming. I'm going to do this. I'm going to save face here. I'll try to fix it with God in my bedroom. And then I'll keep right with my friends and I'll have it fixed with God. He sees all your scheming. A perfect heart and a willing mind. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him in your heart, he will cast thee off forever. 2 Corinthians 8, 12. For if there first be a willing mind. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means God is on the throne of your life. That means God feels like he has his preferences, have unrivaled priority and authority to dictate your decisions, what you do, the why you do what you do. God knows the why. He knows he's on the throne. He looks at that person and he says, there's a lot of imperfection there, but they want me on the throne. They're going to listen. There's a willing mind then it's accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Because that man has God on the throne, and God has the ability to present you with light to walk you out of darkness. But he needs that willing mind. <clears throat> Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, their own affections, idols in the heart, 
and by good words. In spite of the fact they're not serving God, they're serving their own affections. They still have good words and fair speeches and deceive. Beware. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Whatever the motive was behind that deed is as good as he was. <clears throat> Trying to uh, move through this a little bit quicker here. Think of Simon Magus that we talked about. He comes in there, give me this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, they may receive the Holy Ghost. And he offers them money. Oh, that sounds pious. Peter perceives the problem through the, because of the Holy Ghost's perception there. He says, Thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent of thy wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart can be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Wow. There was something dirty in that heart. There was a whited sepulcher full of dead men's bones opened up. Yeah, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If any man among you seem to be religious and seek some personal prestige or some personal advantage through money, charity, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Think of Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, they're going to come and give an offering to the church. God should be so pleased. They're going to come give an offering to the first century apostolic church. They lost their life. God did that. They lost their life. Talk about this man's religion is vain. They were going to give a donation to the church. And they were a little dishonest about how they were going to do it. You think being a little dishonest makes any difference? Is a big deal? They were giving a charity donation to the church. God saw an idol in those people's heart, and it was themselves. God didn't just knock them dead for a little mistake. God saw an idol in those people's heart. They were coming, they were polluting his church. And his verdict was just. What if Jesus was here today all of a sudden? He could call you out on your thoughts and your motives. Your thoughts and your motives. <clears throat> the, who you worship how many of us in here would be neither at the Lord chosen this God's not looking at the outward he's looking at the heart how many of us in here would be these people have idols in their heart Jesus was there with the Pharisees and he exposes them for all their works they do for to be seen of men they do all those works. Men see them. But it didn't bear any weight with God. They made broad their phylacteries. They enlarged the border of their garments. They loved the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. Oh, Jesus, why did you tell them that we loved it? That makes it all look bad. We were just filling our proper place. Why did you have to tell them that we loved it? Because that's what it was. They weren't filling their proper place. God didn't have his proper place. They were doing it because they loved it. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Oh, Jesus. Why are you trying to make our long prayers look bad? You're, you're, you're ridiculing us. You're, you're talking about their prayer? You're ridiculing them for their prayer? Sure, Jesus? Yeah, it's, it's all a pretense? Seriously? For a pretense. <clears throat> Make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation, he says. What? Because they, in a pretense, made a long prayer so that people would think they were more spiritual than they really were because of how they prayed? You think anybody does that? You think anybody does that? Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. Lord, Lord, we prophesy in your name. We cast out devils. We did many wonderful works. We made long prayers for a pretense. You're going to receive greater damnation because of that. 
you had greater light and you knew you should have been doing these things and you did it because you loved the prestige, you did it for a pretense, but you knew you were supposed to do it, right? There's greater damnation there. Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, my brethren, he says, you did it not to me. Then he goes on, you pay tithe the mint, anise, and cumin, all these things. Have omitted the way to your matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not leave the other undone. He exposes them so many ways. We don't have time to go through all of it. But then in, uh, in Luke 12, he says, In the meantime, when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, and so much they trod one upon the other, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. <clears throat> For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. Neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. That going to be a good thing for you? The ear in closets proclaimed on the housetops? <clears throat> spoken in darkness? Heard in the light? that bring joy or dread? Nothing covered that shall not be revealed. Joy or dread? Is there an idol in the heart? You think Jesus was worried about when things got exposed on him on Judgment Day? You think he'd be worried? I don't think he'd be worried at all. He didn't have nothing to worry about. There was no sin there. There's no sin. If there was anything in secret, it was just because that was the appropriate thing at the time. But when it comes out on the housetops, everybody's going to know I was doing just the right thing. Right. There's dread in your life over this reality. There's probably an idol in there that needs to be dealt with. It needs to be uprooted. You need to get yourself in a place before God where you can honestly feel joy at those warnings. At those... Spoken realities of what's going to happen. If any man among you seem to be religious, and what would it be? What could it be in your life? What's the Lord speaking to you about? If any man among you seem to be, yes, I seem to be religious. I even seem to be religious to me, but there is one little thing here that I've been thinking about. Don't ignore that. Don't ignore that. Someday we're going to walk into a throne room. Someday you're going to stand before the judge like those boys did before Eliab. Oh, you don't want to hear neither hath the Lord chosen this. You don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear that. It's done at that point. Okay. We seem to be religious. Maybe it's not the tongue for you. Is there something else that's deceiving your heart? You thought it was okay? Tonight, you can kind of see that it's not. You don't want to have a religion that's vain, that's worthless, that's a waste of time. Pure religion, but undefiled before God and the Father, is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Unspotted from the world in its values, its attitudes, its appetites, its speech, its doctrine, its motives. The world's motives. That covers a lot of them. And if you can get it all the way down to the motives, all the way down to what dictates your life, all the way down to whose preferences rule your decisions. Well, I don't always know what God's preference would be. Are you trying? Does God know you're trying? If God knows that all he needs to do is let you understand his preference a little more, he's a, there's a willing mind. It'll be accepted. He doesn't have just a lot of those people there waiting. A lot of times in life we know what God's preference would be. Unspotted from the world. Inside, that the outside may be clean also. Right. Cleanse first the inside, that the outside may be clean also. But I know that if I can get the inside right, it's going to come on the outside. Jesus knew that too. 
if he could get the motive right, if he could deal with the heart, Amen. the outside would be clean also. Don't tell me that the inside's all that matters when you have a dirty outside because you twisted what Jesus said and took it out of context. He said that the outside may be clean also. And it will be. And I know that if we properly deal with the root, properly deal with the decisions of your heart, the throne room in your life, that I won't even really have to elaborate on the outside that much. It's gonna, God, will, God will show you his preferences. Once God's preferences, if I can get God's preferences on your throne and they, he has this in your life, I don't really have to um, <clears throat> say a whole lot more. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If I can get you to think right in your heart. Right. Until God's wisdom, commandments, preferences have the unrivaled priority in your life, he will never be able to trust you like he did, Daniel. You'll never be the ten times better. You could dream of it. You can say amen to the preacher when he talks about it. You can think pomp, you know, pious thoughts that, yeah, I'm headed that way. Yep, I'm going to conquer. And you can think all that stuff. The devil doesn't care as long as you never get there. But until this happens in your life, you will never get there. Right. Thank you. <clears throat>